Good. So good morning. Uh, today we're talking about give to the bit. Now I'm going to talk about what it is, why I use it, who else uses it, um, when I use it and how science and give to the bit go together and talk about a little bit about learning theory and, um, and give to the bit and how that all works. So to start us off, I want to just describe what it is exactly. Now, give to the bit is an exercise that I teach all of my horses right at the beginning of their ridden training. So it's, it's a simple pressure release exercise. So what I do is I pick up some pressure on one rein only and I ask the horse for some lateral movement of its head. So to move its head in towards the pressure. Now, we're going to remember we need pressure, we're, sorry, excuse me, we need movement to train. And so here the horse is moving its head. So what happens is we put a little bit of pressure on, the horse moves its head laterally and we release the pressure and praise the horse. So it's a simple pressure release exercise. And more often than not, it's the first time the horse has really had some consistent pressure release training. Um, sometimes you know, with young horses, they've been taught uh, to lead using good pressure release. Other times they have been taught to lead using just pressure um, and without much sort of thought about the release. The important thing about pressure release is not really the pressure that you have to use, but it's when you release. So it's how timely your release is, which tells you whether or not you're doing a good job with pressure or release. So the horse is set up here to learn about looking for an answer in movement. So let's say it's the first time we put the bridle on the horse and we pick up some pressure just on one rein and ask the horse to move its head to the side and release that the moment the horse does. The horse then understands and learns quickly that pattern where it feels the pressure, it makes a movement in the right direction and it gets released. And that works very well with the horse because it sets it up after that to look for an answer in movement. So later, much later when we're riding the horse, you know, if we use this pressure release throughout, when we're riding the horse and we put the leg on, for example, we're asking the horse to move something and we're gonna release that as soon as the horse does. And that follows throughout the horse's training from the very beginning to the very end. And, and that's basically what give to the bit is. So it's the only time also that we're really only looking at the horse's head and neck. So when we're asking for that slight movement, that slight lateral movement of the head, we're really only talking to the horse's head and neck. So we want the horse to move its head and neck which is really not something we ever want to do again. You know, once we start riding, once we start really controlling the horse's body, really we're looking at the feet. You know, that's what we want to move. We want to move the feet. The head and neck for me, you know, it's a little bit like the handbag of the horse. I want to set the horse up in a nice round soft frame so that the horse can um, be in self-carriage and that's really important we'll talk about that a little later but and that's this is the way to do it but really we're talking when we start training the horse we're really talking to the feet and we're really using pressure release to move the feet where we want them to go and so if we can set the horse up with some really good give to the bit that softness in the bridle it makes it much easier for us to control the horse um, so that's why we do it. Basically, it gives us um, a soft and round horse. And so that's really important because if the horse isn't soft in the bridle, then um, it, it can pull against us. And what happens is horses desensitize to rain pressure quite quickly. And if you look at modern dressage horses, you know, they're, they're holding a lot of pressure on their reins. Usually these horses are in double bridles as well. Quite often they've got quite tight nose bands on too. So there's a lot of pressure there and it's unrelenting pressure. So when you have unrelenting pressure, the horse desensitizes to that because there's no reward in that. Whereas when you're using proper pressure release with give to the bit, the horse learns to maintain that posture itself without the pressure. 
because the horse knows that when it lifts its head up again or it puts its head too low, then it'll feel pressure again till it comes back to the correct position when all the pressure will be released. Um, and so who uses it? Well, it's a, it's a technique that I learned from John Lyons when I was in Colorado. Uh, in the States, there, there were Western riders. And so, you know, John and Josh were Western riders. And so there, the posture of their horse was very different from the posture of the horse that I was riding. I wanted a dressage horse and they wanted Western horses. So their horses um, were being trained, you know, quite with very low heads and often behind the vertical a bit as well, which weren't things that I wanted. But the thing that I learned very quickly about give to the bit is you simply release when the horse is where you want it. So it doesn't really matter what, you're, what posture you're wanting and you can get exactly that posture as long as your release is good. So you, you ask for the horse to move its head and you release that pressure, all of that pressure, when the horse is where you want it. So that is really important. Um, now, the next thing I wanted to cover quickly was when do I use it? And I use it, as I say, with all my horses, all my horses that are going under saddle. So if I've got a very young horse that isn't yet um, wearing a bridle, then that's, that's fine. I'll teach it a version of give to the beard, um, which is just give to pressure. So basically, it's my most basic pressure release ridden exercise. Well, obviously it begins before you ride the horse because it begins when you're training the horse on the ground. But before the horse wears the bridle, I'll do something similar in a head collar, for example, with a young horse, just to get it to move its head, flex its head from side to side with pressure release. So it really is that simple. It really is just a pressure release exercise. Um, I, think, I think what happens is people get a little bit confused about the the posture of the horse and give to the bit and on the bit and a dressage posture and a um, trail riding posture and a lot of people look at the way my horses travel and say I don't need that because I'm not going to do dressage I don't need my horse to be in frame because I'm just going to go riding trail riding or riding around the paddock or the field and so it's unnecessary but the thing is that Actually, it has nothing to do with dressage. The posture that the horse is in has everything to do with safety, nothing to do with dressage. So if you look at the horse behind me, for example, you'd see that, that bubble that it's in. And this is what I talk about a lot. I talk about the bubble of communication. When I have a horse that's in self-carriage and light in the bridle, and is maintaining that posture without my having to hold it there, then I'm free to direct the horse's feet. So the horse is then relaxed and we're communicating and we sort of travel in this bubble that keeps us on the same page, really. And I know, and I like the thought of that, because as soon as the horse maybe gets a fright or gets distracted or something, what happens? The first thing that horse will do is prick its ears. And that for me is a visual of the horse breaking the bubble. And so I can immediately see, oh gosh, you know, the bubble's broken. I need to get the horse back in here. And we know, you know, when the horse lifts its head like that and takes its attention away from us, that that's exactly what's happened. It has, it's left the safety of our bubble. We've lost its attention. Once we've lost the horse's attention, we don't really know what might happen next. We are much safer with the horse and I on that same page and in that bubble of communication and in what I call the engagement zone. And the engagement zone is where the horse is slightly more emotional than it would be if it was standing in the paddock, but not so emotional as to be anxious or scared. And there's a, there's a place in there, which is exactly what give to the bit gets me. And what that is, it's engaging enough to keep the horse interested. It's engaging enough or interesting enough to keep the horse in that bubble. But it's not so much that the horse is 
um, is going to get nervous. Right? So what the most important thing is relaxation. You know, so what we want the horse to do is to stay relaxed in that bubble of communication because that's the most important thing. We can't really teach the horse anything without relaxation. It's very important that we start with relaxation. And so if we're fighting with the horse about posture, as you often see in modern dressage, for example, where they've got a lot of pressure, that's arguing with the horse about posture, that's holding the horse into position. The horse's main focus will be on that. The horse's focus is going to be on anything that hurts, anything that is stopping the horse from relaxing, pain especially. So you've got a really tight nose band on a horse, its focus is going to be on that. Now that, that might enable you to keep the horse under control. Um, I'm sure that works sometimes, but it's really not somewhere we want to go. I'd rather, you know, for, for us, and I always look at um, people sort of, I always think about, you know, me riding a horse, I can't physically hold that horse in frame. I've got no interest in getting that strong, quite honestly. Um, what I need to do is train the bit between its ears. And give to the bit, for me, is the one lesson that gets the horse between the ears. It's the one thing that opens up that line of communication for me. Because it's a simple lesson, because I teach it as such a foundation, it's really easy for the horse to understand and it becomes a very automatic response very quickly. And whatever we teach the horse, we're really just teaching the horse habits you know, good habits, hopefully good habits, not always, we're not always teaching good habits, but hopefully we've got something in mind to teach the horse and it will be a good habit. Give to the bit is very much one of those. And as is something that we repeat and we do every time we get on the horse, you know, we ask for softness and we ask for self carriage, then the whole, it becomes an automatic response. Now it's a bit like driving to work every morning. If you take the same route to work in your car, it's a pretty much an automatic response. And I'm sure sometimes you get there and you can barely remember the journey. And that's the same with the horse, with lessons that we teach well, that become really good habits and become automatic responses. And that's what we want with Give to the Bit. And if we're consistent with our release, then it does indeed become an automatic response. It also enables the horse to build all those top line muscles that it needs to carry us. And so that's why I like to teach this before I ever get on the horse. And so what that means is when I'm starting a horse under saddle, I'm, I teach it give to the bit first, and then we do all the groundwork, including long reining. And the horse spends all that time traveling in self-carriage and in frame, which allows the horse to lift its back, elevate its shoulders, and build those top line muscles that the horse is going to need when I get on board and it has to carry me. These horses naturally carry sort of 60% of their weight on their shoulders and only 40% on their hindquarter. And so then we get on and we say, which compounds the problem because we sit on the shoulders basically. And we say, right horse, now what I want you to do is put your hindquarter underneath you and elevate your shoulders. And the horse goes, well, I can't do that. All I can do is pull myself forward with my shoulders, you know? And so, but by teaching the horse this before we get on, then the horse finds that really easy. And the horse finds it much easier to carry us because it's got the muscles to do so. So what happens if you've got a horse, a new horse that has come from a different discipline or a horse off the track or, you know, a horse that's already been started that doesn't have self-carriage, isn't soft in the bridle and doesn't know how to travel in frame. Or let's say you've got an old dressage schoolmaster that's been used to having sort of masses of pressure and um, very unrelenting pressure. Can you still teach it give to the bit? You know, can you still make that horse light and soft in the bridle? And the answer is absolutely yes. And I find actually quite often those horses like it more than most, you know, they, they sort of go, oh my gosh, there's a, there's a release coming. You know, you're going to release that pressure. You're not just going to hang on to it and then pick up more. And they really seem to appreciate that. 
especially the sort of off the track horses. I love teaching them because with the um, race horses, they are subjected to so much pressure and so much meaningless pressure. You know, if you look at them racing, both the standard breads and the thoroughbreds, they, they've got a lot of pressure in their mouth the whole time for no reason whatsoever. So it means go fast, it means go slow, it means stop, it means, it means everything and nothing all at once. And then if you watch them just being led around, especially the thoroughbreds, led around the saddling paddock, have you ever seen that? And you, the strappers like jerk on their rein the whole time on their mouth, but for no reason at all. So it's bang, bang, bang on this horse's mouth. And so the horse learns to ignore all of that, you know, which is really sad. It, it really is sad because, you know, they're, they're just as sensitive in the mouth as any other horse. Um, you know, people that tell you a horse got a really hard mouth. Well, horses don't have hard mouths. They've just been desensitized to pressure. So our job when we come to teach and give to the bit is a matter of resensitizing the horse to pressure. And it's a wonderful thing to watch because these horses, the first time you pick up pressure, so if you have a horse that's never had a bridle on and you pick up, you know, an ounce of pressure on one rein, the horse goes, oh, gosh, let me find an answer for that. And, you know, it, it quickly says, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll find an answer for that and starts moving its head. And when it moves its head in the correct direction, you give the you release all the pressure and the horse goes, oh, OK, that's pretty easy. But you don't need very much because the horse has not felt that before. With the off the track horse or the dresser schoolmaster, for example, they've had the opposite experience. So they've been taught to ignore pressure. And so the first time you pick up pressure with that horse, the horse goes, mm, yeah, whatever. And it will completely ignore you. So you're gonna to have to pick up a lot of pressure the first time. Now this worries a lot of people because they think, oh, I don't wanna pick up that much pressure on my horse. But you've got to remember learning theory here. You've got to remember that the pressure is your motivator. So if the horse has been desensitized to pressure, and let's just use kilograms as, you know, as an example, let's just say you've got a off the track horse that's been, you know, used to say, let's say 10 kilograms, that's a lot, yeah, 10 kilograms of pressure on the reins, and it's learned to ignore that. Okay, so let's say you pick up nine, 0.99 kilograms of pressure on one rein and you hold on to that the horse will ignore that because the horse has been taught that nothing happens with that amount of pressure nothing you've just got to live with that that's the lesson the horse has learned over time however if you pick up 10.1 kilograms of pressure the horse that will be a new thing for the horse. So the horse will then start to look for an answer. The horse will move its head to look for an answer. Now, it has six directions that it can move its head. Up, down, left, right, back, forward. And you're just looking, if you're holding the left rein, for example, you're just looking for the horse to move its head to the left. And then you're going to release. So you may have to wait while the horse moves its head up and down and right and forward and back. You may have to wait. Um, and then release when the horse moves its head left. So that you had to pick up one point, sorry, 10.1 um, kilograms of pressure. The next time you pick up that same rein again, you might only have to pick up nine kilograms of pressure. And now the horse starts to learn that pattern. And the horse learns when the release comes. The release comes when it moves its head to the left. And so over time, with some horses very quickly, with some not so quickly, it depends a little bit on how desensitized they've become. But over time, you're gonna pick up less and less and less and less. And I think that this is what often gets forgotten in um, horse training today, is that what we're really aiming for is to get the horse to respond from less pressure, not from more, from less. We're, we're trying to get the horse, trying to teach the horse good patterns. So if we give the horse the opportunity to learn the pattern, what happens quite quickly with our off the track horse that was requiring 10.1 kilograms of pressure to have a response, 
is that horse will then see you raise your hand to pick up the rein and it will give. It doesn't want to feel the pressure. It learns the pattern. It knows when the pressure will go away. So it knows that the pressure is coming. And so it responds before it feels that. And then you're creating an automatic pattern of behavior, a habit that the horse will do automatically. And once that happens, then you've got the horse that you can then start saying, okay, now that that's an automatic behavior, now that you really know that pattern, now I can start controlling your feet. The give to the bit exercise, the initial exercise, takes about five minutes, you know, probably on each rein, depending on how desensitized your horse has been to pressure release um, and desensitized in general to handling. So some horses, you, you know, you need to switch them on a little bit and maybe just increase their emotional level a bit to engage them, get them to respond. Some horses that have been like riding school horses and things are quite shut down. And so you do need to increase their emotional level just to engage them and get them to respond to something. But really, we don't want to teach a lesson like that where the horse is quite still for very long. It's really important that we get the horse moving. And the good thing about movement is that that actually increases the horse's emotional level without us having to do anything much else at all. I think the important thing to remember is, is just that though. It's very important that you get the horse to respond initially. Because if you, if you don't, you know, if with that horse, it's been very desensitized to pressure, you're, you're picking up nine kilograms over and over and over again, you're just further desensitizing that horse to nine kilograms of pressure. And that's not getting any of you anywhere. You know, what you're much better off doing is picking up 11, getting a response and then working your way down. And it's very important that you are conscious of working your way down. Even if you only start with, you know, 500 grams of pressure, even if you start with a really light horse, but you're always trying to work your way down. And because you're building an automatic response, what happens, we were looking the other day at a horse that was um, doing tempi changes. And it was very, the horse was very nice, the horse was really relaxed and, the, um, the rider didn't have a lot of rain pressure or anything. And it was, it was a very nice picture. And I think the thing is that that rider probably could have taken the bridle off that horse and the horse would still have done the tempi changes and would have remained in that frame. The reason being is that it's become an automatic response for that horse. And I find that when I take the bridle off the horse, the horse usually still travels in frame because it's just become an automatic response. That's how the horse carries itself. It's a posture, it's a self-carriage and a posture that the horse has learned over time with a lot of repetition. So, you know, we often say that um, practice makes perfect. And of course, practice doesn't make perfect at all. Only perfect practice makes perfect. And so I think it's important that you're aware that every time you don't release, you're untraining the horse. So every time you pick up pressure and hold it, you're making the horse less sensitive to pressure. So that could be leg pressure, or it could be rein pressure with give to the bit. It, you know, it could be just um, riding every day with a good contact. Every time you don't release, you're untraining the horse. Every time you release well at the right time when, with what you want the horse to do, you're training the horse in a good way. So, you know, people talk about horses being on the bit. And I remember when I was young and we were riding, you know, it was a, the big thing was to get your horse to be in this frame, in this certain frame. And, you know, it, it meant sort of playing, you know, play with a bit in the horse's mouth and wrap your legs around the horse and all of these things. And when we got it, you know, when the horse was in that frame, we pick up more pressure to hold the horse in that frame. There's nothing, this is not self-carriage. This is just the opposite of self-carriage. And so, you know, what, I, what I'm teaching now is exactly what self-carriage is. The horse should be doing the carrying. The horse should maintain the frame and the posture and the gait and the speed 
until the horse is asked to do something else. And that's what happens from doing good repetitions of give to the bit and similar and similar exercises. The, the nice thing about give to the bit, I think as well, is that it is an exercise that's very easy for people to do. And it's because we all ride with some sort of pressure. And anybody that tells you that they only use positive reinforcement, you know, you need to look closely at that because do they ride the horse? If so, then they're using negative reinforcement because they're using their legs and their hands. So that's negative reinforcement, pressure release. Um, do they lead the horse, put a head collar on the horse? If so, they're using negative reinforcement. So, you know, positive reinforcement's great. We use it all the time in horse training. It doesn't have to be food. Um, you know, it can be a scratch on the wither. It can be a kind word. It just means adding something. And if we look at give to the bit, for example, there's a lot of positive reinforcement involved in this. Yes, it's a pressure release exercise at its most basic. But, you know, we also add scratching the wither and we also add kind words and stroking the horse. All of these things go together. You know, training is always a mixture of positive and negative reinforcement. And most of the basic things are learned with pressure release. Um, and, you know, it's not so much, as I discussed earlier, it's not so much the pressure as the release that's important. And I think we forget that a little bit. You know, it's very easy to say, oh, yes, pressure release, pressure release. But it depends when you release, doesn't it? Because I always say, you know, people say, how many repetitions does a horse need to learn give to the bit, for example? And that depends on how good your repetitions are. You know, I would say possibly... 20 perfect repetitions on each side. If you've got ordinary repetitions, then you probably need 300. You see, it's, it really does depend. If every time the horse gives, or just as the horse starts to give you release all the pressure, it's going to be pretty fast. If you maybe don't release a couple of times, if you sort of release late or forget to release or don't release at all, then that's a bad repetition. And so I would think you'd have to do five or 10 more good repetitions to make up for that. Because by not releasing or not fully releasing, then you're untraining the horse. And as we come back to just the basic learning theory of, um, of pressure release and negative reinforcement, and it's the same for whatever we're teaching, you know, whether we're teaching the horse to load onto the trailer, it's exactly the same. So we put pressure on the horse, perhaps in that situation with the whip, asking the horse forward gently by tapping it with the whip on the hind quarter. And as soon as the horse thinks about going forward, you can see it in the horse, it shifts its weight to move forward, you stop tapping. If you keep tapping when the horse is already doing that, it's possible that the emotional level is going to go too high and the horse will step forward and then back again. That, that could likely happen. So the better you're reading your horse, the better your release is, the better your um, training is. It's absolutely the case. And the nice thing about the give to the bit exercise is that you can do it from the saddle or from the ground. You get walking really quickly. So People, you know, tell me, oh, I don't have much riding experience and I'm a bit concerned about riding. Well, the best thing to do is to start these ground exercises on the ground with your horse where you're learning together and then just take exactly that exercise with the horse with the same frame and same posture and do it under saddle at walk. It's a very different thing from getting on a horse that you don't know with its head in the air and it's hollow back and just hoping that you're, you've got some control because that's what a lot of people do really. I mean, I won't ride a horse that I haven't taught give to the bit with. Like I won't ride a horse unless it's in this sort of frame that the horse is behind me. That doesn't mean that I, you know, can't teach that in 10 minutes. I can teach it in 10 minutes as can you, but I won't get on a horse that doesn't at least know that because I, know that if the horse gets a fright, sticks its head in the air, and it can then, because it's straight, it can then 
it's got its whole skeletal system to pull against me. And I know that I'll have no control. And I'm not interested in riding a horse that I have no control over. So it, the horse needs to know these certain things. And the first thing it needs to know is softness and self-carriage and what pressure release means. So once you teach the horse that there's, there is a release and that that's the horse's job is to find that release. And so throughout the training, you know, we start with this lovely, simple give to the bit exercise which doesn't take long, but it's a, it's a good start and it teaches the horse all about pressure release. So the next time that the next thing we teach would be shoulder control. So we start to teach reverse arc and same rein, same foot, which is where we move the feet around depending on where we're holding the rein. So we've already got the horse is already soft in the bridle and in self carriage. The horse is already relaxed because that's what give to the bit gets for us. And then we start taking control of the feet. And next week, or maybe the week after, I think next week, we're gonna talk about the shoulder control. So I'll, I'll talk to you about how we move from this basic give to the bit into the shoulder control. And how the give to the bit forms that foundation of everything else we're gonna teach on top of that. So that is basically me for today. I'm going to... Um, Unmute you all, if I can. Not quite sure how I do that. Must be a way. Um, hmm. Anyway, and has anybody got a question? You could raise your hand if you have a question. Libby, can you raise your hand for me? I just want to see if it, if it works. Oh, good girl. Well done. Good. So have you got a question? <laughs> no, you're still muted. All right. Okay. Well, I'm going to say then there's no questions. Um, oh, you're not now. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess my question was about, um, what am I saying? Okay, looking at kind of an opposite um, uh, theory, if you like, um, of the horse taking up contact and reaching into the bit and blah, 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 and all that sort of stuff. Um, how does give to the bit in, in practice compared to a horse um, seeking out the contact? Yeah. Yeah. I, my, my problem with seeking out the contact is it's a really sort of vague term, isn't it? I mean, what is a good contact? Can you tell me that? Can you, what, how many newtons or how many kilograms of pressure is a good contact? Hmm. I would think, like I've heard the, the concept of just holding hands, you know, that you just are, are holding hands with the horse. Yeah. Mouth. Is that um, a good yeah. I think for me, I think the problem is, is that it's actually impossible to define. And until we start, you know, actually using um, rain tension gauges and things like that and finding out what some of these figures are, then I think we're going to be pretty surprised because if you ask a elite level dressage rider what a good contact is, um, they'll probably tell you it's holding hands. If you go and test them and see what they're using, they'll be using over 40 kilograms of pressure. So, you know, it's a, it's a big difference. Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's, it's, um, it's impossible to define and it's because horses desensitize to pressure so quickly, it's an ever increasing number. So if I say, if for me, a good contact is um, two newtons of pressure, I'm, all I'm doing then, if I never release that, is I'm desensitizing my horse to that. So over time, to get the same response, 
I'm going to need a bit more. Mm. It's the same as leg. You know, we used to be told, wrap your legs around the horse. Well, what happens then when I want to do something else? Yeah, so I need more leg. So how do I get more leg? Like squeeze the horse harder. Well, if I desensitize the horse to that much, because it's always there, then, you know, it, it's increase, there is an increasing amount. And I think that's my problem. I, I can't see if the horse will be in self-carriage without my having to hold its hand, why can't I leave it there? That's my, that's my feeling um, with it. So you would describe, um, if you had to describe your feeling, how, when the horse is in self-carriage of your hands, it is literally sort of light as air. Yeah. 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 It is actually carrying itself. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Right. Someone else had a question. Correct. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I have a horse that I ride that he's nice and collected and he's on the bit in the walk and the trot. But as soon as I canter him, he takes off <laughs> and he's not on the bit anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. And he's very relaxed at walk and trot. But for some reason, as soon as you, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> There's, I don't know how to get him on the bit with that. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And I think what happens is that their emotional level just goes so much higher in the canter. And it's, it's always the case, you know, it, with each increase in speed, the emotional level increases, even speed within gait. So walking slowly is less emotional than walking fast. And so when you teach give to the bit, and I, I, you know, you've said that the horse already knows X, Y, and Z, and that's great, but it's possible that the horse doesn't really um, know that self-carriage and the posture. And with that horse, what I would be doing would be long reining. So once you're long reining, the horse gets to learn all those things without having to carry you. So with long reining, and there's a webinar in there somewhere that you can have a look at. What yeah. it teaches the horse is the self-carriage and the transitions, because it's much easier for the horse to learn that without having to carry a rider at the same time. Um, and the difference between long reining and lunging is huge because with long reining, you're holding one rein in each hand and you can still give. Um, so the horse gets you know, a, a full release but also the horse is learning about self-carriage and about traveling in frame. And so that's really where I would start with your horse, Corinne, is to, to use the long reining to bridge that gap that you've got. And it's a very, very common problem. A lot of people find that, you know, and you, even if you're teaching give to the bit right from the start and you're doing really well, it's a learning process for the horse moving from trot to canter okay. under saddle. It, it always is. It's more emotional. Everybody's emotion goes up a bit. And the first thing when your horse gets more emotional is the head goes up and burst your bubble. Yeah. So we've got to get the horse to stay relaxed, stay in self-carriage, maintain posture throughout that transition and then in through the canter. So it's a matter really of keeping the horse in the bubble throughout the whole ride, which is why that bubble is so important because it doesn't matter what gate you're in or where you're traveling, you've got that and it's centered on relaxation. So that's what's happening is your horse is stop, stops being relaxed. It's quite relaxed in trot, knows that, it's good with that. And then you, you go to cancer and it's no way too, way too scary, way too emotional. Yeah, now, good question. This horse used to be um, an eventing horse and he, he's older, he used to be a hunter. I mean, does that have something to do? I'm, now I'm just riding him in the school because he's, he's old, but I, I can't, it, does that have something to do with him not being able to do this in the school? I don't know if he was ever in a school. Yeah. I mean, I, or something. It's strange I think, to me. Yeah, I think that um, you're dealing with a horse that's been highly trained in a different way. So he's learned all these things especially a hunter, you know, he's probably, do you mean hunter as in out in the big wide world hunter? 
yeah, fox hunt. Fox, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So you know, this is fox like galloping through fields. This is when he's in that gate. That's the way he travels. That's what he's been taught. So you're not just training; you're untraining and retraining. And that's yeah. So it makes it a bit harder. <laughs> well, it's a little bit harder, but it's it's no different. And I mean, it, it is a little bit harder. But you just you have to think about this for, with the horse. Um, is that he's been taught to do it one way, and now you're going to ask him to do it a different way? And that's fine. But you just need to be really clear on what it is you want him to do. That's why I say the long reining is a good option because it's very difficult to teach that when you're riding. It really is because, right. you know, if you're giving the horse also other cues as well that you may not realise. You've got leg cues, you've got weight cues and all sorts of other things going on. Whereas if you can just sort of let the horse relax and go into canter on the long reins, it's much easier and you get that on, on the ground and then right. you get on and ride the same thing. But there's no reason why your horse wouldn't. But I imagine if it's a hunter hunting, um, in, when I was in the UK, I retrained a lot of hunters. We used to get Irish sports horses and their history was always, he's a gelding, he's six years old and he's hunted in Ireland. And it didn't matter if it was a three-year-old mare, the, the history was the same. It's a gelding, it's six years old and it's hunted in Ireland. And they're all like, amazing i mean all they did was stick their head in the air and go fast um yeah but he does <laughs> <laughs> and i found taking those horses back to the basics with give to the bit they would just all went oh thank okay. god for that you know it's that easy yeah it's that easy really it's that easy. it's quite a tense thing you know this hunting business um and I'm not sure that the horses enjoyed anything like the riders do. Um, so I would, I would do that. I would really take him back to the basics with the give to the bit because he will never have been taught that. And it doesn't okay. matter what age he is. Okay. It's something yeah. you can, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, please go ahead. I'm sorry. For yeah. So it's something that you can, you can teach them at any age. The older horses usually are very grateful. Um, and, and so that's what I would do. I would start with give to the bit and I'd get him nice and round and soft in walk and trot and then go to the long reining to walk and trot and canter in the long reining. And then when you've got that, then ride the canter. And so you go through that, that process, starting on the ground with the give to the bit. Don't assume that he knows it. Just because he travels in frame and walk and trot, um, he won't have been taught give to the bit. He will have been taught put up with pressure, um, but he won't have been taught to self-carriage. Okay, okay. And with those horses that you retrained, um, do you think like a novice rider could take them out in the trails or will they just bum around the trails? Think? Oh, no, I think, I think they'd be fine with a novice rider because they've got a really solid understanding now. I think a lot of the problem with those horses and a lot of the reason their emotional level is so high is because they're confused all the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, there's no real, nothing really means anything solid. So, you know, pressure can mean stop, but, you know, it can also just be there constantly because they're galloping around the countryside. Um, you know, it's what happens when you start to actually train them using this sort of system is everything starts to make sense to them and the, everything becomes very predictable. The hunting life is a very unpredictable life, not just for the fox. Um, it's for the horses, it's a very unpredictable life and it's a very high stress life. So if you can start building this bubble for the horse, it'll enable him to relax and just be with you. And most of them, the older ones, they really do seem to appreciate that. They pick it up very quickly. Okay. Thank you. Cause he, he ha he does seem extremely, yeah, it took a long time to calm him down. And I thought, why is he so anxious? <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think it's confusion, yeah. So the more you can do that has good patterns, the, the better he'll be, he, re he really will. He'll really benefit from those patterns and the give to the bit's really nice way to start because it's pressure, give, release, reward. Also goes, oh my God, this is easy, 
really? This is all I have to do? She thinks that's good, you know? Um, and, and they really start to engage with you. It's, it's a lovely thing to see. But yeah, a lot of that stress, the horse, the high emotional level comes from confusion. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's very helpful. You're welcome. That gives me a lot of clarity. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Good. Great question. Any other questions? Oh, all good. All right. Well, in that case, thank you all very much for coming and I will see you next time.